Lecture number 23, The Lutheran Book of Concord and Saxon Visitation Articles. Number one, whatever differences between the Lutheran and Reformed Reformations were revealed in Luther himself and Melanchthon and the later Book of Concord in 1580, the depth of the difference is seen even more clearly in a document such as the Saxon Visitation Articles of 1595. Now, we didn't take much time for this as we were moving through, but um, there was some indication of the fact that Luther had a close relationship with the state, and that Frederick the Wise had rescued him from a probable execution after the decision at the Diet of Worms and protected him, and so on. But uh, Luther did rely on the help which the state gave him. He wrote a tract appealing to the noblemen to uh, understand and side with the uh, Reformation. And so from uh, the beginning, in a sense, even though something in the writing would indicate that Luther was inclined uh, church governmentally the way Calvin was, Lutheranism, nevertheless, because of the exigencies of the situation, developed a very close relationship with the state. And the state, because of its relationship with the Lutheran Church, would send around representatives to examine the condition of the churches and deal with them, and various and sundry guides for quizzing children and for examining pastors and so on were given. My late father-in-law used to like to tell about the representative who would call in a certain area to quiz the children on the catechism. And because the catechism was to be the subject of examination and they knew what the catechism questions were, they would divide them among themselves. You take this group, you take this group, and so on. And when the examiner would come, of course, and would ask the question, the person whose question it was would answer promptly and very accurately and very impressively. But one of the visitors was a little too shrewd to be taken in by that maneuver. And instead of just asking the question, my father-in-law said he designated the answerer and said, why do you believe in God? And the young man whose question it was not immediately stood up and said, the fellow who believes in God sits over there. Well, there were more serious examinations than that uh, for the pastor. In these Saxon visitation articles of 1595 were a typical guide. Number two is a typical guide for Lutheran officials by which they were to examine Lutheran adherents and ministers in various localities in Saxony where Lutheranism was well nigh universal. Three, in addition to the usual and to be expected differences concerning the Lord's Supper, one sees a systemic difference that explains why many old Lutherans, as they're called, came to regard Calvinism as a form of fatalism worse than heathenism or Islam. See, these questions uh, were afraid of what we call the last time crypto-Calvinism secret Calvinism, a Calvinism which was creeping into Lutheran areas without being detected. It was, it was uh, felt. Remember, uh, Luther was a great champion of what was called Rhina Lera, pure doctrine. And those who followed in his train gave the same notable adherence to that very admirable uh, formula. The Calvinists were just as committed to pure doctrine growing right out of, <coughs> of the word. But since there was difference, some difference, between Lutheran interpretation of the Bible and what was therefore Rhina Lera and Reformed interpretation, manifestly there would be differences. And what one group would call Rhina Lera, the other would consider very unpure impure teaching. And these, uh, as I say, uh, any idea that uh, consubstantiation was not uh, the truth or that any words 
indicating merely the dynamic view would be warned against. A part of the visitation articles uh, indicate what the Calvinists say vis-a-vis -vis the Eucharist and why that's wrong and to be avoided and so on. Well, that doesn't surprise anybody. We know that that's exactly the Eucharistic doctrine which Luther held and the Lutheran tradition with him. And while Melanchthon may have vacillated a little on that, Lutheranism didn't. But there were other uh, doctrines, uh, which was distinguishing the Rhine Alera of pure uh, Lutheranism to the very impure doctrine of the uh, Calvinists, besides this matter of the Lord's Supper. And as I say, the people who held to that, in spite of certain changes, got to be known as the old Lutheran, the one who wouldn't move at all from what they understood to be the teaching of Martin Luther and were very sensitive to any uh, changes, however subtle, and regarded any change as uh, very, very serious, denuding the power of the gospel and actually introducing heresy at that particular level. Now, as I say, that error, we knew the, Puritan, the Lutherans would uh, look askance at and warn against and so on. But they also dealt very specially with this matter of predestination. The Calvinists were seen as adherents of that doctrine, and that doctrine had been clearly repudiated by the Book of Concord in 1580 and was considered a heresy, and a heresy so dire that it was actually construed as fatalism and consistent with that estimate, the old Lutherans would consider Calvinism as worse than Islam or Judaism or paganism. And they would be right, of course, because Calvinism would be posing, in their opinion, as, ad as advocating Christianity. And when, as a matter of fact, instead of teaching Christianity, which they professed to believe, they were teaching this pernicious doctrine, they were worse than the Muslims who didn't pretend to be Christian, or the Jews who had broken away from it, or the fatalists who had no religion at all. It may seem dire to those of you who are not familiar with how severe various turns in church history can be to have one Christian calling the other worse than a non-Christian, but if you look at it carefully, you would see that would be inevitable. If this is a misunderstanding of the Bible, if this does amount to fatalism, I who believe this doctrine, for example, if I could be shown that that doctrine actually amounts to fatalism, I would renounce my doctrine right away, or if I really was committed to this and learned, to my surprise, that it was fatalism, I'd reject Christianity. It's that serious, you see. Fatalism is certainly contrary to Christianity. And as far as the old Lutherans were concerned, with their Rhine Alera, the Calvinists who held that, while maybe conscientiously and honestly, but profoundly mistakenly, uh, consider that Christianity or actually teaching a fatalism. And uh, old Lutherans didn't tarry too long with the fact that they might be sincere about it. The point that they wanted to make was that that was an absolutely soul-destroying doctrine and had to be opposed vigorously. Now, at the same time, as we have shown, that was the doctrine of Martin Luther. He taught it every bit as clearly and perhaps even more emphatically than John Calvin ever taught it. But don't tell the old Lutherans that. They won't accept it. They don't believe it. They don't think that uh, Martin Luther was any fatalist, and they can't believe that that doctrine is anything other than uh, fatalism. So, they say you get that severe attack. It all goes back to Luther. Remember in the consubstantiation issue, you're of another spirit, an Andra Geist. That was not generally characteristic of Martin Luther, but you can't deny. As I say, that's the saddest episode in the history of the Reformation when Martin Luther
actually regarded the Swiss Calvinists as of another spirit because they didn't accept consubstantiation. But with the veneration which the old Lutherans had for Luther and so on, it's not surprising that they find a doctrine like predestination teaching fatalism, which would certainly be contrary to the teaching of Jesus Christ. They couldn't entertain the idea that these people were Christians. Now, where were the Calvinists on all that? The Calvinists believed the predestination of the teaching of the Bible. They were not guilty of fatalism. They weren't departing from the Christian religion. They weren't worse than Muslims. They really were faithful to the doctrine. And the Lutherans were mistaken in their attack on predestination. Did they counter with the same kind of criticism? Did they say, you Lutherans are of another spirit? No, they used the word naivus, wound. You wounded the body of Christ. You see, as far as the Lutherans were concerned, you killed Christ by this kind of doctrine or by deviation from the Eucharist. You're worse than heathen. And as I say, if you'd once take that view, you can hardly draw that, avoid drawing that conclusion. But Calvinists never took that view of what they deemed Lutheran error, either of consubstantiation or what Lutheranism came to consider as the true doctrine of the decrees. This is wrong. It's serious. And you can't pick up a reformed treatise of this era which doesn't point out the Lutheran error there as well as the Lutheran error at the Eucharist and other places and so on. But they nevertheless always regarded them as brothers who made a serious mistake. But they believed that they made it honestly. They really thought that was the doctrine. And there, of course, were Lutherans who felt the same way about the reform. But many of them were saying, and certainly Saxon visitation articles were saying, that this is a travesty on the Christian religion. This is worse than heathenism and so on. And make no allowances for the fact that the error may not be as serious as it seems to them and that the people who perpetrate it may not be haters of Christ but really lovers of Christ who are endeavoring to do Christ's will even though the Lutheran would think they had misunderstood. I don't want to suggest that every Lutheran believed that every Calvinist was worse than a heathen. But it was a widespread thing, and it's very definitely canonized in this kind of, uh, of literature here. And I don't want to say that every uh, Calvinist took as less serious a view as the fact that the body of Christ was wounded by the Lutherans, and their error was serious but not fatal. There were Calvinists who, too, would raise the question whether if you make mistakes like this, you can preserve the Christian religion. But one has to say generally, the old Lutherans felt that the Calvinists had actually departed from the Christian religion, and the old Calvinists thought that the Lutherans had seriously erred, but not, were not guilty of ceasing to be Christians. Number four, the Reformed championed their differences, but never seemed to have viewed Lutheran error as so grave. They were a wound in the body of Christ, but not a fatal blow. Number five, though Luther himself was an uncompromising predestinarian, not a whit less so than John Calvin, these articles find that doctrine to be profound heresy. Number six, growing out of the difference between Lutheran and Reformed thinking on the Lord's Supper arose differences in Christology also, because the Reformed deny the corporeal presence of Christ in the supper, they are denounced as restricting Christ to heaven and denying his presence in the Eucharist. That's the way the articles go there, that the Reformed don't think that Jesus is there when you celebrate his death. He's restricted to heaven. These Reformed were saying the body of Jesus Christ can only be at one place at one time. And right now, it's at the right hand of God, the Father in heaven, in what the Reform would call the session. And while the Lutherans would believe that Christ rose bodily, 
indeed was, according to the Apostle Creed, seated on the right hand of God the Father Almighty, they came to believe that that body of Christ was actually able to be at many Eucharistic services at one time by what was called ubiquity. They knew they were up against a problem. The Reformed were saying, look, Christ was a true man, and he had a true body, and a true body by definition is localized. If it's in heaven, it can't be on earth, or it's not a body. And uh, of course, the Lutherans were aware of that. But somewhat in the spirit of Luther at uh, Marburg, if Christ said such and such, I would know it's true no matter how absurd it sounds and so on. And they felt Christ was saying very, very clearly that he was corporeally present in the sacrament. Therefore, even though it sounded like a denial of common sense and every law of physics and so on, to say that his body was in heaven and yet on earth and indeed on a hundred or a thousand sacramental tables and so on, they would say it because they believed Jesus Christ taught it. And then they would be uh, obliged to explain how one body could be at more than one place at one time. They wouldn't quite say the body had become omniscient. I mean omnipresent. That would be the implication, really. You know, I remind you of uh, Chalcedon, you remember, where they pointed out that Christ was true human and that the nature of a man was not taken up into the deity. The body of Jesus Christ was not taken up into the deity so that it became omnipresent or a non-body. The Lutherans were aware of that and they honored that fourth ecumenical council. As I told you, the Lutherans tend to honor the first four ecumenical councils, including and especially emphasizing Chalcedon in A.D. 451. So agreeing, in a sense, that the human nature of Christ was never taken up into the divine and being unable, therefore, to say that the body of Christ, a human characteristic of Christ, took on a divine characteristic of omnipresence and so on, but still confronted with a problem, if it wasn't omnipresent and was a body, a true human body, how could it be present on a table of the sacrament and in heaven at the same time? And they came up with this particular word, ubiquity. If you look it up in a dictionary, all ubiquity means is that a person seems to be at a number of different places at one time. He's not really so, but you know there are people who get around many places very rapidly and we sometimes kid about them being ubiquitous. But we don't mean seriously that they are in Orlando and New York at the same time. They're in California and in Berlin at the same time. Not at all. Ubiquity doesn't, is not a serious uh, geographical concept and it really can't be a serious theological concept. But nevertheless, that was the way in which the old Lutherans tried to bail themselves out of a difficulty without going into a Christological error, which the Reform were saying, that's what you're doing. You're using the word ubiquity because you're really unwilling to say omnipresent, but practically what you're saying is that Christ is corporeally omnipresent. But as much as you say that, then you have denied Chalcedon and you've gone into deep Christological heresy. So the, pure, uh, the Lutherans were trying to avoid that by being careful with their language. And once again, we have the case of curing a headache by decapitation because though that solves the problem, that also eradicates all meaning. An application of the body of Jesus Christ, omnipresence means something, but it's heresy. Localization at one place, at one time and so on, means something, and it's orthodoxy. But according to Lutheranism, it's heresy. So to judge, uh, to solve the problem, they simply have to invert a, a word and a concept which has no fundamental meaning in Christology. Number six, 
Now, number seven, I guess we're ready for seven. Probably the worst differences as seen by the visitation articles are the practical ones dealing with the Christian life itself. These grow especially out of the doctrine of the decrees. Well, let me read number eight. According to the Reformed, the articles teach, a predestined person is saved, no matter how he thinks or how badly he behaves. Number nine, on the other hand, the Saxon visitation articles are saying about the Reformed creed, on the other hand, a non-elect person is lost, be he never so godly. Let me read 8 and 9 again so you see the severity of this criticism which the old Lutherans are leveling against the Calvinists because of their unsound doctrine of predestination as the Lutherans see it. According to the reform, the articles teach, a predestined person, an elect person, is saved. No matter how he thinks or how badly he behaves, and 9, on the other hand, a non-elect person is lost, be he never so godly. I'm sure you've heard this type of uh, criticism come up in contemporary debates about easy believism and antinomianism, but it's an interesting thing to know that back in a century when people understood theology far better than they understand it in the 20th century, right in the shadow of the uh, Reformation, people were giving this kind of caricature of the Reformed faith. The doctrine of election means that a person is saved by a divine decree regardless of what he does. He can renounce the Christian religion. He can have six wives, constantly rob banks, just revel in his uh, profanity, and do nothing but sin. But alas, he's going to heaven because he is elect. You almost see a person who is hell-bent for destruction being dragged by the neck against his unwilling disposition. Too bad, the angel says, you are destined for heaven. He has been elect. On the other hand, a non-elect, this is actually, as I say, I hear this sort of thing every day. I've written a good deal about it, and so on. So Dr. Sproul and anybody else involved in contemporary theology and so on, the thing that shakes me to the foundation is that back in 1595, people were saying things like that. But there's a statement in the back, in the Saxon Visitation article, no matter how often you take the sacrament, no matter how godly you are, if you are not elect, you are doomed. I think you realize that's an absolute caricature, I hope with the best of intentions, of the Reformed faith. If a person is elect, he will be changed, converted, a new creature in Christ Jesus. And if anybody is living the way the visitation articles suggest he may be living, for a Calvinist, that's evidence that he's still unregenerate. And unless he's changed before he dies, that is evidence that he is non-elect. But they've got this caricature in mind. Doesn't make any difference about the person. God settles the matter. If he says you're elect, you're elect. If you want to go to hell, it's too bad. You're going to have to go to heaven. And on the other hand, if you're non-elect, you may want to go to heaven. But it's too bad for you. The angel's going to drag you to perdition. You may love Christ with all your heart. Serve him fully. Be an absolutely exemplary as a Christian, at the same time, if you're not elect, none of that counts. The angel looks in the book, and he says to the most godly person who ever lived, you're damned. That's actually the way Calvinism was understood. Here again, I repeat for the 15th time, if this is what Calvinism was teaching, I'd, re I'd repudiate it right here on the TV program. I don't believe that. I don't know a Calvinist who's ever believed that. And I see it as a caricature all the time, but that it could come out in 1595, but it shows how deep the cleavage was before the century was over, right between bona fide Lutherans and bona fide Calvinists who were totally misunderstood. But let's go to number 10. Marburg, the colloquy of Marburg I'm referring to now, is being revisited today, not by old Lutherans and old Calvinists, but by new Lutherans and you Calvinists, 
and a new reformation may come out of it. I'm being a bit facetious here and so on, but the kind of uh, efforts at rapprochement that go on in our century, which is notably different from the 16th century, we are almost illiterate theologically in comparison with the 16th uh, century, though there were great lapses as the one we're considering right now. But as a result of that, most of the dialogue between Protestantism and Romanism is between non-Protestants and non-Romanists. And of course, they have all sorts of rapprochement and all sorts of solutions and acceptance and agreements and so on, which make the historic debate sound meaningless and irrelevant. It's not quite that grotesque in connection with the revisiting of the Marburg Colloquy and so on, but nevertheless, most Lutherans today are not Orthodox Lutherans, and most Calvinists today are not Orthodox Calvinists. And since they do represent, however, the majority of those who go by the name of Lutheran and the majority of those who go by the name of Calvinists and so on, Marburg Revisited is going to have to be a sham. The first volume they brought out shows they've addressed the questions, the kind of questions we're facing here in the Saxon Visitation Articles, and they're coming to some sort of an agreement with it, and they'll ultimately agree, but as far as a fundamental examination of the real points of difference and any kind of reconciliation, I can't see any evidence for that, whatever. And though I pray for those movements, I confess I'm not very hopeful about them.